Sir, and good afternoon, and um, good afternoon to those in other parts of the world. Um, uh, it's unfortunate that uh, Dr. C. N. N. Raju uh, from uh, Bengaluru was not able to join yet because he got caught in a traffic jam, and he was supposed to introduce our um, uh, speaker this uh, evening. Uh, but since it's getting late, I think, uh, you know, I will introduce Professor Chandra Bhachakraborty, uh, who is Professor of English at the West Bengal State University. She is also the Director of the Center for Studies in Gender, Culture and Media, also located at the university. Her specialization is in um, literature, English literature of the long 18th century. Colonial Bengal, Gender and Cultural Studies, actually, you know, quite a wide range. Her notable publications are her monograph, Gendering the Nation, Identity Politics and the Stage of the Long 18th Century from Orion Black Swan in 2013, Relocating Tego's Binodini, New Spaces of Representation in Rituporno Ghosh's Choked Bali, that is uh, for the Journal of uh, Literature Osaka, 2013. She has also worked on uh, Robindranath, the King in Robindranath Tagore's drama, Political Power Reinscribed in Raja, in the politics and reception of Robindranath Tagore's drama uh, from um, Rutledge, 2015. She's worked on the Babu culture, the garden and garden house in colonial Bengal, uh, again for a journal. And um, she's worked on baby, wife, girl, mother, virgin, widow, the body of the Hindu girl child in colonial Bengal. So gender history, uh, media, and uh, the interaction or intersection of media and literature, these are her areas of expertise. And uh, uh, she's written on uh, Ram Mohan Roy, Connecting Hemispheres, Playing with Distance, Ram Mohan Roy, an Indian transnationalist in the idea and experience of distance in the international enlightenment. It's uh, USA Bucknell uh, University Press uh, 2020 publication. So um, uh, Professor Ch uh, Chakraborty is uh, uh, eminently qualified to be talking here to us today. And uh, uh, today, her talk is on Ram Mohan Rai and Sati and the Right Consciousness. Uh, let me also add over here that Professor Chakraborty is an accomplished singer and uh, has a very trained voice. And so with that, I think um, we can ask Professor Chakraborty uh, to uh, deliver her lecture. Uh a very good evening to everybody and also good afternoon to people uh, in different parts of the world. I'm grateful to the Citizens Forum for giving me this opportunity. And a very special note of gratitude is due to Professor Jyoti Gupta for introducing me to the forum. Uh, before I begin with my paper, I, I hope I'm clearly audible to everybody. Am I? Yes, yes, you're audible. Uh, before I begin with my paper, I would like to explain certain premises to underscore the way I understand the role played by Ram Mohan Roy and the strategies that he adopted to achieve his purpose. Uh, the word right consciousness in the title of my uh, paper today might sound anachronistic since the belief that everyone by virtue of his or her humanity is entitled to certain rights is a fairly new concept. My submission is that although the idea of human rights or individual rights was brought to the center stage after the Second World War, its roots can be traced in different ancient tradition and cultural documents, both oral and written. The Hindu Vedas, for instance, the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, Bible, Quran, and even the Analects of Confucius. I mean, these are the five documents which are regarded as the oldest written sources which address questions of people's duties, rights, and responsibilities. Um, 
The later documents that we can sort of allude to or mention are the Magna Carta, the English Bill of Rights, the French Declaration on the Rights of Man and Citizen, and also the US Constitution and Bill of Rights. Uh, yet many of these documents, when originally translated into policy, excluded women, people of color, and members of certain social, religious, economic, and political groups. Nevertheless, oppressed people throughout the world have drawn on the principles of these documents to support revolutions, to support their movements that assert the right to self-determination. The Sanskrit word uh, that can be considered almost equivalent to right is perhaps adhikar. Uh, this word had currency in Vedic scriptures and it was an ancient concept which meant access to the Brahman. Uh, it was believed that all men and women have the adhikar to access Brahma. Ramhon's appeal to the government that women should be allowed to live an ascetic life and not burn to death uh, was perhaps based on this idea that if they're allowed to uh, live, in, uh, live an ascetic life, then this would lead to their spiritual emancipation. Uh, next, of course, that Ramhon's role has been severely criticized, not only by his contemporaries, but also by 20th century historians and critics who have found his position highly compromised and servile to the West. Uh, it should be noted that Ramon's life and work spanned from the late 18th through the early 19th century. It was a time when India did not emerge as a nation, and the devious nature of the colonial rule was not yet fully manifest. In Ramon's days, India and the West uh, remained fluid signifiers. India stood for a conglomeration of several native states, owing their allegiance to the declining Mughal Empire, and also loosely and uh, also loosely meant the South Asian subcontinent. The West signified Europe, North America, and more particularly Britain. Intellectually, the West implied a long cultural tradition that can be traced from the classical period to the Renaissance Reformation to the Enlightenment. Uh, when Warren Hastings became the governor general of the Bengal presidency in 1772, a large part of India was outside British control. By the time of Ramon's death in 1833, the British emerged as a dominant power in India, which still comprised non-British territories, semi-dependent and dependent kingdoms. The idea of India as a nation state had not yet emerged, and nationalist thoughts uh, were yet to take their shape. During the early phase of the colonial encounter between India and Britain, the ideological space inhabited by Raja Ram Mohan was both transnational and transcultural, marked by a continuous and vibrant circulation of knowledge, precepts, and men. In this extended space, the situational specificities of the writer was important, as this gave him perspectives both experiential and relational, with regard to the world he inhabited and the tradition that he inherited. Roy's cultural eclecticism and religious tolerance were largely derived from his extensive travels, which undoubtedly broadened his mind and encouraged him to combine cultures separated by distance. By citing from his words, we shall deal with, therefore, the collective assemblages of enunciation that shaped in the words of delusion quarterly, a whole micropolitics of the social field. Ramon accepted the ideal premise underlining the civilizing process of British colonial rule. That is, Western Enlightenment ideas of nationalism, science, justice, democracy could revitalize India and combat everything that would be termed as, again, quote unquote, irrational. This, however, did not merely involve a reiteration of the colonial binary, but a reformulation of the same in the context of India's historical and traditional past. However, his idea of the past is by no means limited to gradients of time. Contrarily, temporality became intertwined with other distances that come from our need to engage with the historical past as a domain, domain of recreation, re-hyphen creation, affects and of understanding. These overlapping engagements, perceived diversely as effective, ideological, and conceptual, provided 
an analytic framework for exploring different modes of interpreting the past. Thus, the most important question for this modern intellectual was how to interpret tradition and make it relevant in the context of contemporary international discursive trends. Ramon vigorously participated in the formation and circulation of traveling discourses, I've borrowed the word from Said, through his numerous correspondences, essays and pamphlets, which were published simultaneously from India and England. This process of intellectual exchange initiated from the periphery of the British imperial system, produced a West of Ramon's unique perception. It was West upon which he relied intellectually for his rational, pragmatic, and liberal approach to various socio-cultural issues, and also imagined a civilizational bond with it. The Enlightenment represented by Raja Ramon was not a derivative of the Western Enlightenment, but had its origin in the Asian indigenous traditions. The three different types of civilizations and cultures that he came across and sort of tried to bridge were the Hindu, the Muslim, and the Christian. Uh, I mean, all the three were ever hostile to one another. Both Islam and Christianity belonged to the rulers. Both were prophetic with well-defined sets of practices, and both asserted their doctrinal superiority over Hinduism, which remains somewhat uh, amorphous because of its diversity and caste differences. The need to counter challenges posed by both Muslim and Christian conquerors to Hindu life and traditions necessitated a reinterpretation of the Hindu spiritual heritage. It is in the assessment of history as a storehouse of usable elements that Ramon's contribution needs to be recognized. I should place my argument on Ramon Roy's role as an abolitionist of the custom of sati within such a frame of understanding. I'm uh, sorry for this uh, long preamble. Uh, let me now begin with the uh, talk proper. Well, uh, my academic engagement with the works of Raja Ram Mohan Roy inspires me to see his writings as cartographic. He inhabited a vibrant public sphere in which the colonial hierarchies had not yet become ossified and discourses were being continually deterritorialized and re-territorialized. Located in a matrix of such global exchange, he endeavored to produce a cognitive map that reviewed past and present and created a discursive space for the rearticulation of Indian tradition and modernity, an articulation that penetrated the colonial power structure and also modified the equation between the center and the margin of Imperial Britain. This, as I will argue, is also evident in his writings on Sati. I do not intend to eulogize Ram Mohan or ignore his limitations. Contrarily, in discussing Roy's engagement with Sati, I intend to bring out the complexity of the colonial interface in the early phase of British colonization of India through an attempt to understand Roy's initiatives. It needs to be borne in mind that Ram Mohan's understanding of India's cultural identity was characterized by a selective approach to Indian history and tradition, a fact that is well established in the way he used the Vedic scriptures in his discourses on Sati. As the denizen of a contact zone, that India became the colonial uh, onslaught, the Raja wrestled to minimize spatial and cultural distances, disrupted the binaries of the East, between the East and the West, and placed himself on the world map to speak for humanity in general. His voice marks the emergence of a new cognitive route through which the growth of India's self-awakening can be traced. Uh, I think that orientalized schematization of the colonial encounter and deconstructive post-colonial stance are both prescriptive and hostile to the complexities of such a cultural interface. Uh, placed at a juncture of a theoretical double bind, the case of Raja Ram Mohan can offer a vantage point for Indian post-colonial scholarship. He reminds us that in the creation of modern India, indigenous efforts and the historical specificities of the colonial experiences were as significant as the onslaught of European ideas. His vast knowledge of Hindu scriptures, his mastery over Persian and Arabic writings, his exposure to Latin, Greek, Hebrew, his intimate knowledge of the Bible and Bible commentaries, and the works of several Enlightenment philosophers 
political and literary writers, his intimacy with British Unitarians, feminists and reformers shaped the trajectory of his journey. Uh, it is necessary to recognize that by the time Ram Mohan Roy appeared as an anti-Sati propagandist or activist in Bengal, this Hindu custom had already drawn international attention. Western encounters with Sati started from the 17th century, as reported by the European travelers, and the attitude to this custom changed through time. The early accounts of the European travelers often posited the Sati paradoxically as both victim and martyr, and hence remain confused on the question of the widow's agency. The English traveler, William Methol's view on Sati in 1626 brings out the similarities between European and Hindu understanding of women's sexuality, widowhood, and freedom. Uh, I quote from Andrea Major's works that woman's flawed nature would not be equal to the constraints of chastity is an idea shared by both Europeans and Hindus. Both cultures believed that woman's sexuality is stronger and more capricious than man's, and the image of the lusty widow was a stock stereotype uh, in the European arsenal of women's depravity. The interpretations of Sati and the, use, and the issue of the uh, widow's agency underwent remarkable changes from the 17th through the 19th centuries. Uh, I would like to share a particular document here. I mean, I hope I can do that. Share screen. This is disabled by the host. Oh, no, can... huh? You can do that, uh, Dr. Chakravarti. Please try. Uh, uh, it's saying that host disabled. Okay. No, it is no, okay. Can, yeah. Yeah, yes, yes. Can you see this? Can you see this? Yes, we can see it. We can see it. Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. This is just the cover page of Sati's Cry to Britain by uh, compiled by James Banks. And I will just show the next slide, which is just a let me, let, me put it, let me make it bigger. The next slide is a picture uh, of Sati taking place. I mean, a woman is being thrown into the fire. And the reason why I wanted to project this was because this is a rather long quotation from the Sati's Cry to Britain, and I'll read it out for you. In all the annals of human depravity, it will be difficult to discover a custom so horrible in its nature. This is not the case of a patriot relinquishing his life to establish the freedom of his country. It is not the martyr braving the flames to maintain the rights of conscience. It is not a noble mind sacrificing even life on some occasion of exalted virtue. But it is the helpless and disconsolate widow torn from her family at the very climax of her grief and hurried to the flames amid shouts of an unfeeling multitude. But to demand the sacrifice of the weaker sex to urge the unprotected female is surely a case of unparalleled barbarity and tends almost beyond anything else to develop the extent of the depravity to which Hinduism owes its origin. Now I'm stopping. I don't want to, sh I have nothing more to share. So yes, I, I then go back to the paper proper. Now I will, I have read this out because this excerpt I find is very important because it establishes the change in perspective towards Sati and helps us in understanding the role and the mechanisms which are adopted by Raja Ramon in his war against this custom. Dr. Chakravarti, you may turn on your camera. You have switched it off. Okay, okay, sorry. Uh, yes. Mm. Right. Well, uh, now, the portion that I read just now from the 1827 compilation mentions some very important points. Number one, of course, the barbarity of the custom uh, as a shame to humanity and civilization. Second is the essential difference of this sacrifice from other forms of voluntary self-sacrifices. And thirdly, the sacrifice of the weaker sex who should have been sheltered and protected by the stronger member of the community amounts to the most heinous crime ever committed in human society. 
As the excerpt from studies tried to Britain demonstrate, the self-sacrificing heroine of the 18th century has by this time, or had by this time, turned into a passive victim of social violence in the British imagination of the 19th century. As Victorian gender ideology began to take shape during the 19th century, there emerged a new understanding of femininity and gender relationships. For instance, the theory of the separate spheres, the cult of domesticity and the construct of the angel in the house, the medicalization of women's body, a uh, focus on her frailty, a physical, physical weakness, making her an object in need of male protection. Uh, Andrea Major points to the universal assumptions which made Hindu women more moral than men, but weaker and dependent, she writes. While European women were represented as achieving a certain degree of authority through a benign and civilized society that nurtured and protected their interests, Hindu women were represented as having what little autonomy they possessed by nature, crushed by an oppressive society, a domineering religion, and an unfeeling family. European attitude to sati was also greatly inflected by British discourses on motherhood and familial bonding, female nervous frailty, infatuation, insanity, and suicide. William Ewer, superintendent of police for the lower provinces of Bengal, argued that the frailty of the female intellect allowed her to be easily deviated from the natural path towards suicide. The replacement of the widow's heroic action by insanity and lack of self-control stripped her of the last remnants of agency. And Sati came to be represented as a kind of suicide. And this was largely incorporated within the broader debate about the nature of self-destruction in Britain. In fact, the tales of self-destruction of the Hindu widow became cautionary examples in several 19th century tracts on suicide and urge British women to have the right moral attitude towards self-destruction. Uh, <clears throat> when Dr. Ramon emerged as an anti-Sati propagandist from 1812, he had upon him the entire weight of various international debates and discourses on this custom. He utilized certain strong international opinions, buttressed by his citations from the Hindu scriptures to reinforce his campaign. He thus used the British imperial imaginary of Hindu tradition and linked it to concerns shared with the humanitarian reformers of the West, a discourse that finally took the form of the colonial women's question and the subsequent reconfiguration of Indian womanhood towards the late 19th and early 20th century. Raja Ramon Roy became actively involved with the issue of Sati presumably from 1812, after the abolition of his sister-in-law, an incident that somehow uh, convinced him that there was much more to society's support for this custom than religion. The brutality of the custom in the name of religion uh, covered up human greed for property and the patriarchal domination of women by interlocking religious sanction with the female sex. Women's rights to inheritance uh, were described by the or in the Dharma Shastras. Of the various commentaries of the Dharma Shastras, the Mitakshana and the Daivaga doctrines were most important. Both granted limited property rights to women. However, the possibility of the widow's inheritance was slightly greater under the Daivaga system. Since the Daivaga system was followed in Bengal, there was a growing rise in the number of satis in Bengal from the early 19th century. These doctrines influenced the legal practices of British India and impacted the formulations of the Hindu law. The colonial administration kept within, kept to the exercise of the territorial laws, but assumed a policy of non-intervention with the personal laws of the Hindus and the Muslims. Raja Ramon turned the pro-abolition arguments uh, into a humanitarian discourse and garnered British support by aligning it with several other humanitarian reform movements that raked the world and reoriented the parameters of gender relationships. Roy fought relentlessly against Sati between 1812 to 32, and like his works on religion, the anti-Sati tracts were also translated into English for his foreign readers. Before his relationship with the Sudampur missionaries became strained after the publication of the precepts of Jesus, 
Ramon Roy's Shati tracks were introduced by them to the British audience. His views were publicly lauded and reproduced in several English periodicals. It was, however, James Spates, the writer of the Shati's Cry, who made Ramon popular to the early feminist of the time for his pro-woman stance. His first tract on Sati was published both in Bengali and English in 1818, the second tract in 1819. Two years later, he published a pamphlet situating Sati in the context of the encroachments on female inheritance rights. Over the next decade, Ramon kept up his campaign and participated in the debate about Sati that took place in the Calcutta newspapers, including his own Shangbad Komodi. After the abolition of the custom, when much social resistance followed, and a petition was filed to withdraw the bill. Ramon supported Benting by heading a delegation in protest. Shortly after, he published an English pamphlet um, summarizing his arguments from his 1818 and 1820 pamphlets. When the Orthodox community petitioned the Privy Council for repeal of Benting's regulation, Ramon agreed to represent pro abolition Bengalis during his visit to Britain. The Baptists took note of Ramon's publications of critical essays on Sati in the Friend of India. These were likely authored by the journal's editor, Joshua Marshman. The first one appeared um, towards the end of the 1818, where Marshman summarized, without mentioning the name of the author, Ramon's first tract. And he published it in English as translation of a conference between an advocate for and an opponent of the practice of burning widows alive. Etc. Et this was written in the form of a dialogue between Ramon and the Orthodox Hindus over the scriptural sanctum of Sati. Lane Justifel notes that Western editors drew comparisons to Luther and the Protestant Reformation, indicating just how successfully Ramon had crafted images of a pure Hinduism, growing under the weight of superstition, ignorance, and priestcraft. He accomplished this by convincing British and North American readers that the essence of Hinduism could be discovered in this ancient text and not in contemporary practices. Uh, apart from the Sri Rampur missionaries, commentaries on Ramon's arguments were published in the Asiatic Journal, the Missionary Registers, and alluded to by the Baptist missionary William Ward between 1818 to 21. In 20, 1823, Marshman included Ramon's Sati articles in a special London volume of the Friend of India. And James Hill Buckingham in 1824 published a periodical in London in which he criticized the government's tolerance of Sati and extolled Ramon's views on ascetic widowhood. Um, in 1827 and 1828, James Fix published two editions of the Sati's Trial to Britain and then incorporated most of Ramon's pamphlets in the India's Cries to British Humanity that appeared in 1829. These works aided the anti sati activism to reach its peak and also established the fact that the practice of Sati was not supported by the Hindu religious scriptures and hence should be abolished immediately on humanitarian ground. Natamani has argued that the debates on Sati were not on the widows or women, but on what constituted authentic tradition. All the scriptural sanctions for and against Sati was pivotal to Ramon's arguments. The anti-Sati writings of Ramon clearly challenge certain traditional assumptions of Indian womanhood. My submission is that if we take into account the enthusiasm and sympathy with which the West received and responded to Roy's writings, it becomes evident that they placed him on a larger map of humanitarian reforms and found his position as a Vedantin secondary to that of the social reformer. A right based language is certainly a modern construction, and the pre modern world did not have the conception of legal rights the way we understand it today. Yet, Roy revealed a strong right consciousness when he identifies women's lack of property rights to be the root cause of a social inferiority, resulting in a ramification of social evils like polygamy, female infanticide, and widow burning. As a defender of justice and liberal principles, he wrote to James Buckingham in 1821, enemies to liberty and friends of despotism have never been and never will be ultimately successful. In brief remarks on the ancient rights of females according to Hindu law of inheritance, published in Calcutta by the Unitarian Press in 1822, 
Ramon voiced his concern for the depravity suffered by women in Bengal owing to their state of financial dependence. And this is what he says. How distressing it must be to the female community to observe that several daughters in a rich family can prefer no claim to any portion of the property left by their deceased father. He concludes that this makes a widow, I quote, live in a state of dependence, destitute of all the comforts of life. It too often happens, however, that she is driven by constant unhappiness to seek refuge in fight. Roy dismisses the advocates claim that widows perform sati voluntarily to achieve spiritual reward after self-immolation. And what he says is very, very significant. It is not from religious prejudices and early impressions only that Hindu widows burn themselves on the piles of their deceased husband, but also from the witnessing the distress in which widows of the same rank are involved and the insults and slights to which they are daily subjected, that they become in a great measure, regardless of existence after the death of their husbands. These restraints on female inheritance encourage in a great degree polygamy, a frequent source of the greatest misery in native families. Roy asserted that Sati was an act of suicide to which the widows were propelled by religious bigotry and an inhuman society. It was also an escape through horrifying and painful death because a prolonged state of widowhood spent in social marginality, austerity, and depravity was worse than burning alive. To challenge Sati as a noble act of volition, Roy linked the custom with the question of property inheritance under the Daibhaga law. He explained how the monetary interest of the relatives resulted in large number of Sati in Bengal as compared to the other states of India. He did not have much to say about Sridhon or the property of married women. However, by linking oppression and violence suffered by the Indian widows with the right to maintenance and property, he remained pivotal in the history of women's struggle for selfhood. Ramon's counter arguments favoring abolition of Sati were based on the Hindu scriptures. He used the Vedas to dismiss the Vedic sanctions cited by his opponents. While Several historians uh, have found the Raja's reliance on scriptures regressive. It needs to be remembered that the equation of the Shastra with or of Shastras with the Indian tradition was not Ramon's construction. Rather, he used an essentially colonial understanding of India to drive the administration into legal action. Uh, Lata Mani has rightly observed that official discourse on Sati was united in foregrounding a certain understanding of India where Brahmanic scriptures blind obedience to this text and the religious nature of Sati remained central. However, I do not agree with Lata Mani's observation that Ramun was less sensitive to the plight of women as victims of this cruel custom. The basic premise from which his appeals were voiced was a humanitarian response was the victims of a social crime. Ramon had the astute sense to understand that Hindu religious dogma would not appear sacrosanct to the British and garner the support of the international audience unless some common ground was established. If we look at the dedication to his second conference addressed to the Marchioness of Hastings, Roy is alluding indirectly to the white man's burden to establish the principles of liberty and justice in every part of their empire. And this is what he says. I take uh, the liberty to dedicate to your ladyship, for to whose protection can any attempt to promote a benevolent purpose be with so much propriety committed? Citing Manu as the highest Shastric authority, Ramon enjoins that the widow will allow, will uh, should be allowed to live an ascetic life. Um, and his arguments, again, reveal a shift from a position that saw the widows as Shastric entities bound and shaped by scriptural dictates to an awareness of their subhuman treatment in society. Uh, I would like to quote this because this is very important uh, from Roy's second conference where he, say, where he attacks his opponent saying that, I reply, your object in persuading women to burn themselves be now be distinctly perceived. You consider women as prone to pleasure and always subject to their passions. It is very certain that all mankind, whether male or female, 
are endowed with a mixture of passions. We ought therefore to endeavor to withdraw both men and women from debased sensual pleasures and not to persuade them to die with the hope of thereby obtaining sensual enjoyment. This passage is significant because here Ramon is assessing the condition of the widow, not as a special gendered category, but as a human individual who feels sensual pleasures like any other male member of the society. And he enjoins both men and women to follow the scriptural path in search of a prospective beatitude. Ramon rationally contests all the allegations brought against women by the orthodox Hindu lobby in support of Sati with Regard to women's natural inferiority, he questions, as to their inferiority in point of understanding, when did we ever afford them a fair opportunity of exhibiting their natural capacity? He dismisses the notion of women's mental weakness by pointing to the firm resolution to which she plunges into fire, while men even shudder to think of such a painful death. Her sexual promiscuity and intellectual and infidelity are also established as baseless because Ramon argued that women are betrayed by men in large number and the custom of polygamy proves men's greater propensity towards sensual pleasure. In a second conference, Ramon even deconstructs the sacred Hindu marriage by positing women as his perennial victims. And here he uses uh, the image of the slave to describe the woman in a marital relationship. At marriage, the wife is recognized as half of her husband but in after conduct. They are treated worse than inferior animals. For the woman is employed to do the work of a slave in the house, subjected to mental miseries, and the husband seizes every pretext to torment, I've uh, emphasized this point, a recalcitrant wife in various ways and sometimes even puts her privately to death. What I lament is that seeing the women thus, de thus dependent and exposed to every misery, you feel for them no compassion that might exempt them from being tied down and burned to death. What comes out here is an awareness of the materiality of the woman's body, the physical suffering she underwent in marriage. Ramon associated anti sati activism with the other humanitarian reform movements that Britain engaged with from the late 18th century. These reform movements, such as anti slavery, anti on law agitation, peace movement, chartism, complete suffrage, women's rights for higher education and, and medical reforms uh, are some of these. Uh, both Lean Justifel and Claire Mitchley, I have seen Claire Mitchley have joined this session today, consider the anti-slavery movement to be an important factor behind the emergence of Victorian feminism. Uh, Women's anti-slavery associations also created very powerful images of the enslaved female sex as victims of physical and sexual abuse. Lynn Justifel writes that these linked stories of anti-slavery, humanitarianism, and female activism provide another clue to Ramon Roy's transnational celebrity. From the early 19th century, there was also a strong emphasis in Britain on religious tolerance and liberal values. The Bill of Catholic Emancipation was passed in 1829, and in the same year, Lord Benting passed the legislation against Sati. The two bills clearly demonstrate that public opinion within the British mainland had turned against religious chauvinism. The government tolerated Sati on the ground of religious tolerance, but this stance was also being criti criticized and questioned uh, in their own country. So those who opposed Sati repudiated it on the ground of inhumanity and deliberate murder. Ramon's words in the second conference echo this, this approach. And when he says that those who, in direct defiance of the authority of the Shastras, act the part of women murderers, can never exculpate themselves from the sin of women murder. James Peck, who published the Sati's cry, describes Sati as a murderous practice contrary to humanity. As the liberal and conservative Hindu lobbies cited scriptures in support of their contention, both alluded to the notion of the widow's concept. Interestingly, to highlight the enormity of the cry, the act removed from its uh, ambit the idea of the woman's agency. Um, and uh, also, you know, presented this. They harped on the idea of forced and mandatory death of the widow, both physical and metaphorical. 
Fake's impassioned appeal to the British public to fight against Sati reveals this particular shift in emphasis when he says that it would be criminal to remain silent and a grievous offense against humanity. How would Britain feel if within herself a hundred innocent persons suffer death by some mistake of law? The colonial context on the one hand, the plights of the African slaves and Satis in India on the other, invoked a similar moral sensibility. Uh, Ramon had uh, already described the so-called sacramental Hindu marriage as a state of slavery for women. William Watt also projected the victims of Sati as wretched like the slaves, enslaved by polygamy, superstition, and lack of education. Watt's appeal created a discourse of the British woman's responsibility to make the case of their sex in India a common cause. Ramon was aware of the power of making an appeal to the philanthropic British women and established contacts with the Baptist missionaries and William Ward. William James Fox, uh, in his discourse on occasion on the death of Brother Ramon Roy, published in 1833, uh, tells us that in the annual Unitarian meeting in England in 1831, the Raja met several ladies amongst whom were members of the Athlan congregation who had petitioned against Sati. Ramon Roy therefore made the movement against Sati an essential target for the civilizing mission of a quote-unquote heroic Britain and reinforced a kind of world name that paradoxically provided a strong justification to colonialists. Writing about uh, the state of Sati in India, Joshua Marshman said that they lie bound as sheep for the slaughter and thus they must remain till British feeling and sympathy shall duly realize their hitherto unknown, unpitied misery. The writer of the pamphlet, an account of the York meeting to petition Parliament for the abolition of the demolition of Hindu widows in British India, exhorts every city of Britain and Ireland to cry out in protest, this blood shall not rest on us, let no more widow perish. The writer also hoped to receive the support of all the human, wise and good uh, throughout India. The reviewer in the monthly repository of theology and general literature drew a parallel between advocating the causes of the African slaves and the unhappy captives of a barbarous superstition. The Asiatic Journal, published in London in July 1826, quoted the letters of three Bengalis, amongst whom Modern Mohan Modi appealed to British humanity, magnanimity, and justice to abolish suffering. Coming to the last part of this talk, uh, I'm trying to uh, wind up sort of some of what uh, I was uh, talking about for so long. Tonika Sharkar uh, regarded the abolition of Sati as the first of the major legislations in colonial Bengal that marked the beginning of a discourse of certain entitlements for women. Although Ram Mohan did not categorically mention masculine sexism of Hindu society, he strongly implied that all human customs stemmed from it. With courage and insight, read even in his time and place, Ramon unbared the myth of male superiority, superiority and laid the spiritual and social foundations for women's liberation, one making his brief on the basis of the Shastra and common sense. Now, if we claim that the Raja's deployment of the usable past, uh, the expression I have borrowed from Matran Paranjpe, was merely his response to the outer world, then we will, of course, deny the role or the part played by his personal life in shaping his responses to women at large. No reform, as Ashish Nandi reminds us, is entirely a public event. It is a private statement, and Ramon Roy's was also such a statement. He hailed from an orthodox Hindu family, where polygamy was rampant. Roy himself had three wives, with whom he hardly maintained any relation and mostly stayed away from home. It is said that he had a Muslim mistress who bore him a son, and she, had, she proved to be a more pleasing companion to Ram Mohan than his unenlightened, superstitious Hindu wives. He was much enamored of the educated and liberated Western women, especially the Unitarian feminists whom he met. Although Ashish Nandi detects in Roy a deep rage against Hindu women, I personally think that this intense anger was not directed so much against women as it was against ignorance and superstitions which conditioned them from childhood and made them vulnerable victims of social discrimination and gendered violence. 
While his anger towards her malicious and cruel mother was quenched through legal victory over her, Karani Devi also convinced Ram Mohan the strength of mind and individuality a woman is capable of possessing, and hence the legitimate rights to which she should be entitled. He must also have realized that the worship of the mother goddess as Shakti by the Hindus did not translate into women's empowerment in society. It bred instead deep insecurity and main violence towards women, leading to the coercion of women's rights. His reformed religion made room for women's growth as a companion in a conjugal relationship, her active participation in the public sphere, and her economic independence. To conclude, Ramon certainly initiated a shift at the level of consciousness for both Indian men and women. After his death, William Fox eulogized Ramon Roy as a proto-feminist advocate, favoring such amelioration of education and condition for women as would give the amplest scope and highest direction to their influence on the minds, morals, and the happiness of the whole human race. Now, his writings are even, and his ideas are even relevant to Indian women today because they involve the two main foci, the eradication of dehumanizing customs and tradition, and secondly, of course, uh, education and opportunities on par with men. Thank you very much. So thank you, Professor Chakravarti. May I request Jyoti Gupta for so if you have any questions, uh, people in the audience, if you do have any questions, you can unmute and pose it to Dr. Chakragopi. Yeah, Umeva, please go ahead. Yes, <clears throat> if I may ask a small question. Um, you very rightly pointed out the gallantry and the courage with which Ramohan rescued widows from the funeral pyre, and this is really something astounding for the time. I've always wondered, though, why he stopped short of <clears throat> promoting or even suggesting that widows get married. Uh, you know, I mean, this is an option that you could always make. I say this particularly because the widow marriage question was raised in the Akhmir shop in 1815-16, thereabouts. Oh. So it wasn't as if Ramon was not aware of the problem. And I think he's one of the earliest to draw connections between the fact that women turned widows and polygamy and the entire demographic imbalance between men and women on this question. So uh, that is a question worth pondering about. Secondly, I think it's not just a matter of uh, regressive use of Shastras. I would even say that Ramon created certain major problems for Vidyashagor in the 1850s by citing so much of Manu. Because Manu doesn't really uh, advocate uh, widow remarriages. He speaks yes. of the ascetic widow. And that is an argument which the orthodoxy then used against Ramon, I'm sorry, Vidyashagor, by saying that, you know, why are you following double standards? Who is Parashar? Manu is the person to turn to. And that's exactly oh, what oh. Ramon had said. And this is something which tradition had always followed, that Manu is the prime Smriti author. And to suddenly say that Parashar is the authority for Kali Yuga is a different take on the question. So I think you have to see it in a larger context about how you place and understand Ramon as a social reformer. Thank you. Right, sir. Thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, now, please don't call me, sir. I'm not a, I'm just a colleague of yours. <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. I mean, uh, uh, actually, I've been reading your books on Raja Ramon and also on Vidya Shagar. Uh, so, uh, the reason I, I, what I personally feel that he, both Ramon and Vidya Shagar, they, their approach to uh, the whole question of, you know, womanhood and and female uh, emancipa emancipation was somewhat ambivalent to a certain extent, because. Uh, Ramon again, even even Vidya Shagur, he talks about how the widows were turning promiscuous, how uh, and why they need to be remarried uh, in order to prevent society from going astray. So 
these were perhaps the conservative ideas which which neither Bita Shagor nor Ram Mohan were able to get over. So somewhere deep inside, there was some uh, distrust or mistrust towards women's sensuality or capriciousness that was there. But even even within even I mean even after saying that, I would I would still feel that what he was doing at that point of time. The the, the my whole point has been the way he was trying to use the larger international uh, reform movements to abolish sati was indeed remarkable i personally this is just a speculation i personally think had ramohan not left for england in 1830 he could have, he, stayed could have back, he might have yes. taken up this issue i'm just speculating okay. here because i don't think ramon was such an inconsistent person not to realize the connection between you know, the widow burning on the funeral pyre and the life that was left to the widow after she became oh. a widow. I, I think he saw the connection. And my maybe, hope... Maybe, maybe he did. Yeah, yes, I, but, I, think he, but, I think he ran out of time, basically. That's okay. my thing. And another thing, you know, whenever he was writing about widows, you were talking about ascetic life for widows. You know, something that perhaps, you know, he, he claimed that the Shastras... Uh, oh, he quoted the Gita on that. You, you know that? Yes, he quoted yes. the Gita, surprisingly. Yes. To yes, say sir. that ascetic widowhood is the thing to ask. It's the best alternative. They shouldn't Absolutely. be burned. They should be allowed to leave and leave as uh, as ascetic. And he was also talking about the great sages of the of the Vedic period, the great knowledgeable women, and how she can sort of uh, spiritually improve herself. So thank you for the wonderful paper. Hope to hear thank more you, of you, you in the days thank to you, come. Sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Omi Babu. Is there anyone else who would like to ask a question? Mm. I don't no. see. Yeah, there's Professor Majli. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello. Um, thank you for that wonderful paper. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, really fascinating and um, a lot of connections with things I'm interested in at the moment. And um, one thing I wondered if you could say a little bit more about um, um, was. I thought you captured the, the, the complexity of the early colonial period really vividly, um, where things were less um, entrenched and someone like Roy could see certain opportunities in the collaboration with Western um, activists and even colonial oh, officials. Oh, oh. Um, but I'm just thinking about the, um, the various different um, Westerners that he engaged with, who all had rather different positions, because there were oh. the Baptist missionaries who oh. liked his opp opposition to Sati, but hated oh. his um, religious beliefs and particularly his um, oh. Unitarian sympathies. Oh. 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 And then there were the Unitarians that it was more aligned with. And then there were the sort of evangelical, you know, evangelical were there. Connected to the, the Quakers government. were there. Yeah. So the um, it seemed to have, uh, it seemed to be extremely skillful in kind of navigating through these yes. complicated sort of terrain uh, in order to oh. achieve results. Yes. Uh, yes, that is why I said I, in, the, in the beginning, I was talking about the strategies that you were using. That is the word that I used, that instead of being judgmental, let us see what were the strategies he used. And I think the basic thing that, you know, he harped on is that this is something barbaric. This is something inhuman. So the appeal is to humanity, something that is universal, something that cuts across all, you know, uh, regional politics, regional boundaries religious cultural boundaries so he could somewhere i mean on that ground on humanitarian ground he could bring could bring together the unitarians the baptists the evangelists the evangelists the quakers all the different uh, even the the the, uh, the anti uh, the the, the uh, anti slavery uh, activists so all of them could be brought together or he could bring them together uh, because he was mainly appealing to uh, humanity 
that uh, the killing of a human being has to be stopped. Mm. Yeah. I personally feel that, that that is the common thing that is constantly yeah. harping upon him, especially, you know, in a, from his second conference onwards, especially in the argument the, which, uh, which was published later where he was bringing in sort of uh, the, the, his, his main ideas from both the 1818 and 1822 writings. I mean, the basic point that he was constantly harping about, upon, apart from the Shastras that he was quoting from time and again, the Shastric authorities, is that this is this custom is inhuman. I mean, one cannot snatch away the right to live on this earth from an individual. This, I think, was part of the public discourse in uh, Britain yes. at this point of time. Exactly. Because, you know, the anti-slavery, the abolitionist movements were also, you know, there. So, so you know, uh, it, it was uh, that and uh, that had percolated uh, into, you know, India as well because of the British rule. So yes. it's also, you know, partly that. Yeah, true, very true. Thank you. If there's any other question. Okay. I think uh, Dr. Chondo is yeah. going to give yeah, the... Shonjo Chondo, uh, if you can do the honors of closing. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Chandrava Chakraborty, for your most learned and insightful talk. Um, I don't think I need to say anything more than that because uh, she has been so lucid with arguments and uh, viewpoints. Thank you very much, Professor Chakraborty. On behalf of the Citizens Forum, I thank uh, um, Professor Jayati Gupta for bringing Professor Chakraborty among us. I thank Mr. Omid Das for hosting today's lecture session. And I thank uh, Professor Sudak Sudakshina Kundu Mukherjee for her initiative and for actively organizing the series of lectures for celebrating the 250th birth anniversary of Raja Ram Mohan Roy. And last but not the least, I thank all the participants of today's session for joining and making it a success. Thanks everybody. So thank you everybody, see you in the next lecture. There are thank sessions you. which are happening around the month. So you may be seeing in your inboxes the invitations. So do keep joining in the sessions and hope to see you once again in future. Thank you so much. Thank you.